understanding that there is only one being that illumines it all. There is only one personality that existentially spoken in terms of pure subjectivity. Is that what is experienced as I amness in all circumstances, in all situations? Irrespective of the roles, irrespective of how one may come across, one, when once one is rooted in that understanding, when once is rooted in that experience, because that is also simultaneously always an experience, and that what illumines the experience itself. This is what the true, true sense of oneness, I amness represents. I amness is oneness. And I will go straight to the question entitled Kundalini Awakening, Doubt and Fear comes from Ali. There's a bit of a background. But I will go straight to the questions themselves. There are a few. Starting with, I fear that what is happening to me is purely psychosomatic thing that people have labeled as divine experience. I know I feel divinity, yet how do I know it's not a label I have stuck on myself? I fear that if I believe in my experience fully, it would be tantamount to madness, in brackets, as anyone who has claimed to be connected to the divine throughout history has been labeled as such. Another question, why would this happen to me? And if it is, for what purpose? What shall I do with this doubt? What has arisen now? The second part is that I have experience of nothingness during meditation. And when I come out of, I feel I have a mask on that change, like a carousel of the different reality or realm attached to each mask. Some of these have doubt. Some know for sure what this process is is without any doubt. Why is this? What am I doing wrong? Thank you for your sincere and trustworthy guidance. Okay, so we'll begin with that fear of losing it, right? Fear of losing it and asking whether this is just a psychosomatic thing and what has been perhaps classically, historically labeled as divine, where is proof to that? Indeed, legitimate questions. And in brackets, that addition, that the accounts of those who have claimed to came to that state, right? State of divine, and in fact, sometimes even are classically addressed as a state of divine madness, divine intoxication. So let's first look at this from a place of what do we understand by sanity and the lack of thereof? What do we understand by insanity? And so that we can separate at least wheat from the chaff with regard to what is labeled as divine versus mad versus, let's say, divine experiences versus, versus sheer madness. Because we don't want to just suddenly end up with this uh, very, very gray area, even if it seems so, even if some people will dismiss freely that spiritual breakthrough is not only on par with uh, some form of psychosis, but it's just the madness itself. And let's just keep with these labels and not even bother looking into it further. These perspectives obviously exist out there, and these perspectives are very harmful. In fact, 
These per perspectives is what deprives our current culture from the true and uninhibited unfoldment of our true potential of who we are here in that, let's say, current state of collectively shaped and reshaped consensus of what it means to be a human being. Because there's no such thing as uh, a settled state of affairs throughout history. Every history that we have of how perhaps we've lived as human beings in this civilization, let's say, civilizations that came, flourished, and have vanished, or civilizations that have more or less uninterrupted continuum, like the rare example of that would be Indian civilization, which is as ancient as, let's say, its contemporary civilizations that came and went, ancient Egyptian civilization, ancient Sumerian civilization, Mesopotamian civilizations. There were civilizations in deep inside of the mid -af Middle Africa, civilizations of Yanzu, which arguably uh, the birthing of the what we know as Chinese civilization, but we know it did not uh, have that uninterrupted continuum. So these ideas of what it means to be human are not were, were not the same at all times. And how we understand our the way our predecessors live are always through that prism of our current understanding, of our currently shared ideas, ideologies, and a general consensus. So in other words, when we try to imagine, let's say, how people lived in ancient Greece 500 years before Christ, or before Common Era, and that's not even that far back in time, that's only two and a half thousand years. So we immediately understand this from the place of how we relate to what is considered to be, let's say, an accepted way of being, an accepted way of what it means to be a human being, given a variety of different ways of how it expresses itself, uh, with some nuances in this or that culture today. So this needs to be examined very attentively what we consider as madness, and normally it's moving beyond certain, let's say, accepted socially, psychological boundaries. Something which simply is considered to be uh, one way or another, unacceptable somehow one way or another is considered to be, uh, let's say, um, socially unacceptable for a variety of reasons. This also would need to be treated very attentively as what and how we deal with this question in terms of existential state of affairs, let's say deeply subjective experiences of how we feel in that moment whether this is the state of dissociation, whether we kind of like went beyond all these boundaries that are dictated by the upbringing, moral, social norms, and whether this is in fact runs in contradiction, if not conflict, with the uh, outer conduct with people, with society at large, with uh, obviously starting with the nearest and dearest to us. So these are not just uh, irrelevant questions. These are very important questions to consider. So we cannot just view this for only from the one vintage point, that of how we feel, how you or I feel in a particular moment of our time when we go through a certain, let's say, phase, and we can loosely call it a spiritual breakthrough. So, this also clinically can be distinguished what is considered to be madness and what is considered to be simply breaking the boundaries of one way or another 
societally imposed, culturally imposed, moral codes of conduct, without which, of course, no society can function. So it, it, it's a, it becomes a very, very uh, balancing act. On one hand, there are very few cultures out there left which have a healthy, in inverted commas, tolerance, acceptance of how those people who walk away from otherwise norms of society and how they conduct their affairs, how they live. So many times this has been brought to our attention that how in India this exists to this day. I mean, after all, look at the images of the Kumbha Mela festival when a million or over a million of naked sadhus smeared in ash wearing all these garlands of not just Rudrakshas, carrying skulls and like really, really as if decorated for some kind of um, film about our ancestors, just go on a pilgrimage and gather at a place in Allahabad at the confluence of the great rivers, which is considered to be a holy place. And therefore, these Kumbamela festivals are being held there for many, many hundreds of years. So in that particular culture, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong to encounter a naked Saturn anywhere, particularly during that time. Okay, maybe you will not encounter naked sadhu sitting outside of Marriott or Hyatt Hotel in the center of Delhi. But it is a common sight in many other rural areas where there is this uninterrupted way of life where sadhus, those people who consciously, deliberately walked out of societal norm, societal norm, because the late motive, at least from that understanding, is pursuit of the greater reality of who we are. See? So not only society tolerates that, there is also an acceptance, and in many cases, a respect. As in India, you can ask Indian, traditional Indian, and he will tell you that it's a grave error to insult sadhu. Not only because it's considered to be impolite and somehow offensive to do that to the person who walks away on, on the norms of life in pursuit of God, let's say, but also because it simply could be a tricky business because one can inherit um, an unwanted curse or some such thing. So all this was to illustrate that what is considered madness in one culture is not necessarily considered madness in another culture depending on what are the societal norms. So if we acknowledge that, if we understand that, if this already gives us these parameters, that it's not in the madness itself that we are being defined as such, but rather the very term madness here is a quite a flexible idea that is imposed or superimposed on what is accepted as a behavioral, let's say, modus operandi, in certain cultures and where it is not. Obviously, you can't parade naked in the center of Madrid, New York or London. The police will stop you uh, for indecent exposure. So that's very simple. So therefore, this kind of behavior will be accepted as, uh, well, inappropriate. And one would be questioned why one is doing that. Is it an act of protest or is it just simply one forgot to put one's clothes? And so one would be asked to maybe do some consultation to check one's state of uh, mental uh, sharpness. And so there we already enter that clinical perspective. So this is where I begin to answer the question only now once we gave that outline. So this 
What is actually madness in clinical terms? Can we draw the distinct line between what would be considered losing it in terms of becoming insane versus going through authentic, true, spiritual unfoldment? And the difference is vast. So this is very important for us to acknowledge once and for all. In the case of insanity, when certain, let's say, systems no longer functioning the way they should function, results in breakdown of what otherwise is always is checked against the complexity of how we interact as social beings, because we are social beings. It's also with regards to how we feel about ourselves, how we are in with regard to our immediate environment, those nearest to us, physical environment, the environment in terms of the whereabouts, all these, all these, all together is checked by extremely refined, complex network of all those, let's say, areas responsible for that being in the environment, feeling the environment, knowing, for example, when it is warm and hot, when it is cold, when it is breezy, when it is um, birds are chirping around, or this next moment it's raining and it's, you know, and next moment this is, let's say, environment where I can sit down and relax because this is uh, conducive. So this is where people eat, this is where people converse, this is where people read books. I'm not going to even go there. You understand exactly what I'm saying. So in other words, this goes seamless. Seamless. There is this without... We, we don't employ any faculty, mental or otherwise, to determine. It's all subject to a certain upbringing. Differences are here, of course, again, in terms of what is considered to be an appropriate or inappropriate code of conduct based on one's level of upbringing, education, manners, and so forth. But when it comes to the spiritual side of these affairs, when something breaks down, the boundaries fall apart and boundaries fall away, not because we feel freedom, but we simply don't know, we don't have a clue what we are actually doing. These boundaries have nothing to do with the boundaries that are consciously being laid down. And this is the difference between divine madness, let's say, and a sheer madness, because when a state, when a being is in a state of ecstasy, in a state of beatitude, bliss, many of these social kind of driven um, concerns are abandoned, simply laxed, as if if one was wearing certain uh, armor, or as it will come closer to you, some other part of your question uh, about the masks. This. Uh, masks, masks of politeness, masks of convenience, no longer required. No longer required, they're no longer needed. And the being is simply displays this maybe uh, outwardly in a, in a certain way, uh, a, maybe a, a greater degree of uh, what otherwise would be considered frivolous in some other circles, would be considered inappropriate. But it's not because there is a breakdown of this functioning in the system which instructs one at all times about one's environment. You see, one may consciously disregard the fact that it's cold weather and walk out in shorts when one is in that state of beatitude. But one is not going to do that repeatedly if that begins to cause a physical discomfort resulting in catching a cold, feeling freezing, and so forth. So this is just entering that very complex um, 
conversation, let's say, on what and where the boundary between madness and sanity is. So what are, let's say, the factors that will give one internal sense, that internal compass? And this distinction here is lays in terms of the, funny enough, what and how our mind is engaged with at any given moment. In other words, it's all down to the functioning of the mind. In the ecstatic being, in someone who, for whom boundaries laid asunder, or temporarily broken, opened, mind recedes, in fact, to the background and no longer imposes its uh, conversation based on the incessant activity. No longer mind here is in the driving seat. So, of course, this can result in what otherwise we speak of in terms of that overly free behavior, behavior which is no longer tapered, measured, controlled, because the mind just falls back. But in the one who is, let's say, for whom that internal structure is somehow broken, for that person, all there is, is a continued functioning of the mind. Mind, as it were, cannot shut itself down. And so this distinction between the madman and the holy man, if you allow me that kind of configuration of terms, is in the ability of the holy man to come in and out of mind's activity at will. He or she emerges and re-emerges from these gaps, whereas someone who is subjected to breakdown of mental psychological faculties find themselves in a perpetual, perpetual working of the mind, and that's what constitutes unhealthy state of affairs. So this is what we should truly call madness. So with this allowance, with this, now let's say, angle that we allow ourselves to look at it, interesting vistas begin to open up. And I would invite you to look into it yourself as well, because some very extraordinary revelations may arise, or just simply things become more obvious what we have always considered, that one can in fact be living in a state of madness already whilst not obviously displaying any outward signs of that, but simply because one is con constantly and completely under the influence and domain of incessant activity of the mind. And it's only that borderline where it breaks completely into the area of where one has absolutely zero, zero control of the functioning of one's mental faculties. And this is a madness one doesn't want to find oneself in. It's maybe at the social level, a collectively accepted level of madness that we subjected ourselves in, in a given moment in time, within the framework of this current culture. And that's what make, becomes more and more difficult to remain in a state of sanity. So you see, we're now changing the tables or changing the point of view of what constitutes mind here in terms of healthy functioning mind and mind that gone astray. So go going back to the actual question, that you fear that what's happening to you is purely psychosomatic thing. That people, what people labeled as divine experience is something maybe in the form of superimposition 
Well, you know that everything is one way or another is psychosomatic. Everything. Everything is as we choose to perceive. Everything is in a way colored by the way of our perception, by the way of our understanding, by the way we choose to relate to experience itself. So in other words, experience itself is in innocent. Experience itself, the experience of seeing, experience of touching, experience of tasting, experience of smelling, and so forth, in themselves are innocent. Furthermore, experiencing variety of emotional phenomena, whether this is sad, melancholy, whether this is ex ex excitement, anticipation, curiosity, whether this is anger or jealousy, whether this is exuberant joy in an amorous state, whether this is experience of wonder, these experiences in themselves are innocent, just as sensory experiences are innocent. But what turns this into a psychological dilemma is the way we are interpret them at the level of the mind. So this is where the line of sanity and insanity goes, perhaps with the slight overlapping into the territory of each other, depending on how we choose to interpret what we go through in life. You see? So this is really where you touch closely to the underlining of all that what is taking place, rather than simply interpreting everything at the face value of how it ought to be interpreted. Nothing is ever how it ought to be interpreted. And nothing is ever as it is, it's only how we perceive it how we then in turn interpret that perception. So, in likewise manner, these kind of questions, these kind of questions of one's sanity, these kind of questions and doubts, indeed are psychosomatic. If you prefer to see this as purely from clinical point of view, as something unhealthy, let alone sinister, let alone pathological, then instantaneously there is this already a way how you begin to feel about it. Whereas if it's perceived and experienced as divine, where it is perceived as that what gives us that sense of deep connection, deep intimacy with the, with everything, and confirming that with what is plenty out there, rather than dismissing it, as you have inevitably did, and that what you put in brackets, you kind of brushed all this <laughs> display of divine throughout history that can be, can be seen nothing but psychosomatic phenomena superimposed and in fact it's no more than madness. Well then that kind of frames you within the confinement of that understanding, you see. So with that being said of course the truly divine experience also has a distinctive flavor. So people who have gone through that, even if this was taken completely and utterly they were taken by surprise. I'm not talking about those who have courted that, were preparing themselves and knowing about it. They were educated, spiritually, psychologically educated, let's say in advance. They were welcoming these states. For them it would be still a great revelation, of course, um, often accompanied by uh, a tremendous sense of overwhelming sense, perhaps, of gratitude, 
which in itself may be very, very emotional. But for those even who have not at all considered, contemplated the possibility of such states, and when they have experienced it viscerally firsthand, they knew there and then that this was a confirmation of the divine essence of everything. You see? So I'll leave you with that. And just to remember that doubt, that doubt, it's that switchboard, you know, that working with that doubt. Doubt in itself has that quality. The maybe positive side of the doubt is that it allows us to and propels us to not to take everything at its face value, our own thoughts, our own, let's say, premonitions, our own um, sense of, let's say, of how things are, because, well, you know what, I don't want to trust every thought I think. I have my doubts about it. This is a healthy side of the doubt. But when it comes to the essence of who we are, when it comes to what rises on its own, and then only requires some form of confirmation, some form of a reflection, and this is what this what we're doing right now, that the whole dance and the dynamic of relating one's spiritual breakthroughs as well as one's spiritual doubts is so as to reinstall what is already there, so as to reconfirm and recognize rather than dwell in the darkness. With regard to the that masks, right, that experience of nothingness during meditation and when coming out and like a carousel of different sort of I don't know, masks, that's, do you mean personalities that comes with the masks? And you do say here in brackets that with a different reality or realm attached to each mask. Well, I would suggest that, yes, when we are fragmented, when we are divided one way or another, there is more than just let's say, one being in all circumstances, but it feels as if we have multiple, maybe, uh, roles, because that's what we are. I deliberately didn't say multiple personalities, because this may begin to si sound uh, clinically unhealthy, because there is a term in psychology, in psychiatry, the multiple personality disorder which is highly undesirable and it can have acute conditions when one literally shifts to such degree that one is not aware of another side of one's personality when the, uh, let's say, alternative one takes over. These are obviously, these are obviously what could easily be um, treated as a state of pathology. And we don't want that. And of course, some people have more than two personalities, it could be three, four, I don't know what's the limit to this uh, personality disorders. But it all comes from the split. It all comes from one way or another, nervous system somehow gives in to the accumulated stress, which always boils down to ability to function, to protect itself. So there is certain strategies are developed of how to protect oneself. And so these certain so-called masks, certain personalities rise to defend itself, to ascertain and protect itself. Whereas in the, what we could speak of now as a healthy, normal uh, human being, healthy in the sense of constantly in a state of readjustment to one's environment, just as health cannot be defined in terms of something fixed. 
health is a constant balance, balancing of different aspects, different uh, modalities of nature, uh, having a certain alignment, certain disalignment, having a certain, let's say, illness breaking through, having certain disease or certain something, very often in itself is seen as an attempt to restore greater balance. Likewise, this happens at the level of the psyche. So, ultimately speaking, understanding that there is only one being that illumines it all. There is only one personality that existentially spoken in terms of pure subjectivity. Is that what is experienced as I amness in all circumstances, in all situations? irrespective of the roles, irrespective of how one may come across, one, when once one is rooted in that understanding, when once is rooted in that experience, because that's also simultaneously always an experience, and that's what illumines the experience itself. This is what the true, true sense of oneness, I amness represents. I amness is oneness. That's the coveted state of pure subjectivity, which serves as an umbrella in our own work, which is known in Trikashaivism as that universal egoity. When that state is acknowledged, then there is no possibility for any masks to come and begin to play its own role. We may do that out of our own accord. I'm now a daddy to my little one, and now I'm a father to my uh, grown-up child, you know. When I speak to a four-year-old, I use different language, different mimicking, different kind of body language than when I speak to my 14-year-old or 30-year-old. When I speak to my mother, when I relate to my uh, siblings, when I relate to my friends, I, all, I have all these different facets, aspects. That doesn't mean my personality is split. When I go to work, if I'm in the service and it requires a certain uniform, certain, let's say, outer, stronger appearance, I'm in the police forces, I'm in the military, I'm the working as a, let's say, where you, you wear a certain uniform, which kind of gives that sense of temporal identity. But in all circumstances, you know you're just playing these different roles until these roles shift into another with the centrality of who you are. So there's no place for any, any interference when it comes to what kind of roles. Therefore, all this example, all this kind of like masks falls away. 